My name is Philip. I'm self-employed, and uh, I had an emergency crisis that happened. I came off of a two-week vacation, and I found that I was told the very next day that I had a cancerous tumor in my sinus. They removed it uh, by emergency surgery, and they had to cut me from here all the way down, around, split my lip, down, up inside the lip, and over. Peel back the, the skin, peel back the skin tumor, the tumor. tumor. Um, all at one time. Okay, and this is my very, very first surgery that I've ever had. And it took about uh, eight to nine hours to do. And it was um, very, very traumatic. I, mean, I lost 20 pounds. And uh, unfortunately, I am not able to work at this time. Okay, I. Um, like I said, I'm self-employed, and I have absolutely no income, and uh, I really need your support. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll thank you in advance. Thank you. So I posted a link to his GoFundMe page in hopes that we can all come together to provide whatever financial support we can give him while he's mending. Again, he is self-employed and will be out of work for the next several months. Please do your very best to support him in any dollar amount that you see fit. And let us together encourage my dear friend, Philip. God bless you. Control. Be still, my soul. Stand and watch as giants fall. I won't be afraid. You are here. Greetings, beloveds. This is Adoration with Mac, and I'm your host, Louis McElwain. And tonight, like every night, we're on a mission. That mission is to be a truthful representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be able to encourage and to restore those who are lost in sin, believing the lies of their father, the devil, and show them that there is, in fact, a more excellent way. Tonight, we're not going to belabor the hour, but I got to thinking about some things 
related to foundation. And so when I thought about foundation, I mean, immediately we understand that a foundation is a support mechanism. It keeps us from falling. It gives us the assurance that we can always remain standing if that's our choice. It allows us to know that no matter where we go, that our feet will touch the ground. Now, when we get into that from a spiritual point of view, it even takes on even more of an incredible significance. And so I want to, for a moment, just ask a question. Who is your foundation? Who is your foundation? So I've been thinking a lot about this subject because it's evident by the way that the world is acting, that a decision has been made in general about where the world has decided to put their foundation or put their trust in that, a foundation. We've seen it year after year after year after year, the moral fiber of our world is steadily decaying. In fact, I don't even think the world really has a grasp of what is considered to be moral and just and honest and true. And it grieves my heart when we take that into the followers of the way, or at least the ones who purport to be the followers of the way, because I see my own doing things, saying things, promoting things that show that they have put their foundational beliefs in a different direction than I have. And honestly, it is a sin against almighty God that so many of us purport to say that we know him and that we serve him and that we trust him and that we obey him. And time after time, after time, we fall for messages, we fall for concepts that are anti-Christ. These things can have no foundation in the gospel, but we embrace it. I mean, literally folks, let me give you an example that whether you realize it or not, our world has fallen into a moral crisis based upon this concept that came out long time ago called Marxism and all the kissing cousins of Marxism, which is communism and socialism. They all put on a front that we're gonna make sure that all the people have access to any of the provisions that they need, mainly through government or through some type of leadership model. And interesting enough, those who are in the leadership model don't even follow the actual principle of Marxism for they still remain very rich, very wealthy, while those 
that are in Marxism, whether by choice or because they've been tricked into it, are scrambling to be able to make ends meet on a daily basis. I mean, seriously, that is the world that we are living in. And what happens is this, is that we've been sold a bill of goods on promises that we're going to have world peace. We're going to have unity. We're going to be one, everybody. Oh, that glorious day when there will be peace on earth. Everybody can love whoever they want to love. Everybody can promote whatever agendas they want to promote. There is no more need of any type of a moral standard because guess what? Whatever you say is right and whatever you say is right and whatever we say is right until it's not right. And when you start to put your ideals out there for the public to consume, everything is peace and love when everything falls into line. What, what is falling into line? Sure, embracing LGBTQ agendas. Oh, what's in line? Uh, being pro-choice, being uh, those that say that you have the right to abort. That's towing the line. Oh yeah, and when anyone speaks outside of that or anything else, as uh, it's referred to that the woke generation is promoting, then and you become the pariah. You become the enemy. When someone like myself and others would go around and say, well, but God says something different. You're hated and you're despised and we know that that is for God, for God's sake, for his name's sake. But if you say anything that's related to any type of righteousness and holiness, where, hey, I actually believe that there should be the normal family structure as God has established it with a father and a mother and children, that that man should be the head of that household, that woman should be his support, those children should be obedient. Oh my gosh, that's the best possible situation for anyone to have. And yet, when you say, hey, this is the way God wants it, the world says, uh-uh-uh, we'd rather for you to be woke. We'd rather for you to be in a single parent household or in a household that's led by those that are of the same sex. Oh, or you can just be out there on the street, be an orphan. But no, you can't possibly want to say that the best option would be to have a man and a woman who love each other, who love God and love their children, where the children can look to their parents and see a reflection of God in that household. I tell you the truth. Oh, we have gone into a moral abyss which begs the question, who is your foundation? So I pulled out a few verses because God is addressing this subject. I thought it would be apropos in the little bit of time that I have left to actually address this from both the old covenant and the new covenant. So I wanna just go ahead and cover both of them because we cannot even have this kind of dialogue without the word of God. If we don't have the word of God in it, 
then it's not even the gospel. So if you're with me, turn to Isaiah chapter 28, and we're going to read verses 14 through 16. I am reading from the Eastern Standard Version, but it goes like this. It says, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule the people in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol. We have an agreement when the overwhelming whip passes through. It will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge. And in falsehood, we have taken shelter. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And I want to stop there for just a moment because this is powerful stuff. Now, we have to take everything into context. This is before the human appearance of Jesus Christ. We are still dealing with the people of Israel. We are dealing with the system that was in place, which meant that each year the people would come together, they would go to the temple, and the high priest would atone for their sins. Once a year, this would happen. And we know that in that process, an unblemished, blameless animal would be sacrificed for the atonement of the sins. And I want to put this in context because as I've tried to tell you guys over and over and over again, these words are directed towards Israel. These words were never a part of any covenant that God had with the Gentiles because quite frankly, there was no covenant. However, God gives us the old covenant because in the old covenant, we can see his perfect way and we can understand why it is that ultimately man could never live by God's standards, which is why when we go to the new covenant, we are introduced to this beautiful word called grace. And as the apostle Paul would say, his grace is sufficient. But here in Isaiah, he's dealing with Zion, Jerusalem. And he's basically saying, woe unto all of you leaders, leaders that are following your father of lies, the devil. Woe unto you because you have made hate. You have made lying. You have made confusion and disruption. You have made those things your refuge. You get everything that you ask for and what you have asked for is separation from me, your holy God. That's what's actually being said here, that you have refused my love, you have refused my leadership, and thus I've released you to a reprobate mind, basically. And God is saying, through Isaiah, that he recognizes everything that is going on because you cannot pimp God, 
You cannot fake God and you cannot hide anything away from God. And he's saying, in all of this, you've got to remember, I'm the one who will establish a foundation. And at that time, he was talking about Jerusalem. But we know that later on, it's way bigger than just Jerusalem. Basically, what is happening here, beloveds, is that God, through Isaiah is saying that there's coming one. You might not see him in your time, but he is coming. And that one who is coming will be the one that I endorse, the one who I say, thou good and faithful servant. Behold, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Of course, in Isaiah, he is prophesying about Jesus and his entrance into this world. He's coming as a stone, but not just a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, someone you can finally believe in, someone you can finally trust, someone who will not let you sink into the abyss of shield or into the depths of hell. There's finally one that's coming and you no longer have to worry about sinking sand because he's coming to assure you that the ground that you walk upon will not only be sturdy, but it will be holy and righteous. And he's saying, anyone who believes this, don't be in a rush, he's coming. Real quick, this is a description of our world today. Our leaders have hidden agendas. Leaders in politics, leaders in science, leaders in technology, and dare I say, even leaders in ch church are following a different Jesus, a different gospel. One that is not built on Jesus Christ, but it's built on a foundation that has no staying power. So the new covenant is also giving a message. And in Matthew chapter seven, verses 22 through 27, and again, I'm in the Eastern Standard Version. Listen to this, guys. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Woo, in the King James it says iniquity. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall 
because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. I find it so interesting because it is speaking now about wisdom, the wise man against the foolish man. The wise man knows that if he is building a structure that he must find a foundation that no matter what mighty winds would come, no matter what kind of floods would hit that house, no matter whether they're torrential rains or any other natural disaster, that that house will not fall. The problem is this, beloved. Many of us have been acting as if we are foolish men and we're building our lives on a foundation of sand. And you know, when the wind blows, the sand will go in whatever direction that wind is blowing. You can create a sand castle and eventually it will blow away or someone will knock it away. In any event, it will not last. And what Almighty God, the Most High, what he is saying to us, beloveds, is that many of you guys right now, even listening to me, you're saying, I've done so many things in your name, oh God. Oh yes, I have laid hands upon the sick. Oh God, you have used me to heal people. You have allowed me to be able to bring comfort to those who mourn. And yet God is saying right back at you, I never knew you. Why is that? Because those things that have been done were built on a foundation that's basically a selfish one that's all about me. In other words, I did this, I'm doing that, as opposed to being a servant of the most high God, following his holy and righteous will. Who is your foundation? 